I've started making movies here at 21, 22. And so a lot of the crew members were like uncles or aunts. They would take care of me. I was the youngest person on the movie set. Fast forward 20 years later, their kids are now working on my movies. And that's a wild, wild kind of feeling, like you, you're raising families together. It's gotten you know, really, really good over the years. We have an ease of working together that, you know, just kind of, just kind of fall right into it. It's always great to revisit, and I always enjoy working with Bruce. I have a shirt that Joseph wore back in the day. <laughs> I don't think it's gonna fit me anymore. Yeah. I went up into the attic at my parents' house and dug out so many things, like my script from Unbreakable. The uh, complex notes of a 12-year-old. No, that's me, that's Steve. Oh, that's... I didn't recognize myself either. <laughs> Having that kind of family and that shorthand and that familiarity with your crew, I think, really, really helps. Um, but frankly, as well, it's just nice, because if they've been working for each other that long, chances are they wouldn't have if they didn't get on well, you know? It's come to that time of the production. We have to say goodbye to number one on the call sheet, James McAvoy. <laughs> You walk into a very comfortable space. The set is a family, period, the end. This is the happiest set that I know, and it's so nice to be able to come on set every day and know that you're with people who know you in and out. In the morning, I, I love having a hug from everybody and just getting to see them again. It was really fun to make this film. I kind of pinched myself. I can't believe they asked me to, to come be a part of it. It was actually like stepping into an alternate universe where I was looking at these incredibly iconic characters and actors and couldn't believe, like, what was I doing there? We all have spent so much time together. I adore Knight's loyalty to everybody that he works with, his loyalty to his family. And action. Being around a great guy who likes other great people just makes a really great tribe. <laughs> I could tell even Knight was pretty excited to get everybody back together. The crew has worked on so many of his movies. I go all the way back to The Sixth Sense. I was key grip on M. Night Shyamalan's first movie. I started uh, on his first movie here in Philadelphia. We all sort of grew up together. Knight was very young when he started. Yeah, you guys are, you guys are unbreakable, are you? <laughs> Them there. You know, he's shown a real loyalty to his community, which I think is really important. He's the de facto mayor of Philadelphia. Once you've done one of my movies in Philly, you're, you're on, you're in the family. The collection of main characters. It's a fight like you've never seen before. Nothing about it seems cartoony at all. It just seems very real. Like, these are people that we interact with every day that happen to be a little stronger than everybody else. And when you put two of them together and have them fight each other, it's electrifying. Relative to Split, the action sequences in this movie are really at another level. The physicality was relentless, because for a smaller budget movie that doesn't have two weeks to shoot one action sequence, instead of using CGI, we were doing a lot of that stuff ourselves. James very physical. He's game to do stuff. Obviously, there's some things I won't let him do. I had an amazing stuntman. Zach was incredible. The animalistic run, what it's like, he's bounding. That was Zach. Like, it was exceptional. and he throws his punch and you move. Doing that fight scene with Bruce was great. Hanging on to him and trying to crush him to death. They had it planned and figured out really well, and there's a hell of a lot of thought and practicing that went into it. For me, it's thought out, choreographed, and we're gonna live and die by the momentum because you're gonna move at the pace that I am saying. We are making a comic book movie that is one-tenth the cost of every other comic book movie. We have to make it feel grounded and yet, on some level, have to compete with that level of spectacle. I believe in minimalism. I believe we do our best work when we're faced with the parameters that you can only do this much. These are your tools. Figure it out. Cut. That's a cut. Excellent. Good. I got four prints. You good? Yeah. Check it. I do
do think this is a very, very unusual trilogy. The first movie, Unbreakable, was done in 2000 and was a completely distinct stylistic approach. And then we did Split. It had its own style that wasn't quite related to Unbreakable, but I thought that could be our great asset, that this trilogy is three separate feelings that are talking about the same subject. So I wanted Glass to be able to stand on its own and not be derivative of either movie. I think it's a valid culmination of a story. Elijah is still very calculating. He's still very watchful. He's still strong in his conviction. I remember watching Unbreakable in a movie theater in New York City somewhere, and now here I am, and there's Sam Jackson, and there's Bruce Willis in a really great, scary, psychological thriller of a movie. And so to be part of all that is really a dream come true. Split didn't even feel like a superhero movie at all. It was a scary movie that only really revealed itself at the end when David Dunn actually shows up. That took it way beyond just linking it to Unbreakable. When Split came out, the Unbreakable music starts to play at the end. And I know that Knight had been talking about doing a sequel for a long time, but five years go by, 10 years go by, 15 years go by, you think that there's no expectations. But it's crazy, it's crazy being back. I've never done a sequel or anything like that before, and so it's so interesting carrying the baggage that you already know because you've seen a chunk of somebody's life. Kevin? It's you. That's what makes this movie really special. It was really interesting writing the project because I already knew the voices of these characters, so I could just literally put a character in a situation and just start writing it. But what was great when I got the script was that it was taking the superhero, supervillain archetype and putting them in a very, very different kind of movie. And I think that's exciting. As you're watching it, you're trying to figure out what's going to happen and what's really true and what is the story about and how it's going to land. And I didn't care if I had two lines in the movie and, and no real part. And for all I knew when I said yes, that's what it was going to be. Back in the day when I did Unbreakable, people weren't making comic book movies, so it seemed silly to even mention comic books in the marketing. That's really where we were at that time. And then Split, because of the nature of the reveal at the end, we couldn't tell anybody what it really was, that we were setting up this character in the Unbreakable world, that we were setting up essentially a comic book villain. So I could never tell audiences. They couldn't be framed before they saw the movie. But with Glass, we can. We can say that's exactly what we're grappling with. What if comic books were based on reality? I understand that the three of you think you are superhuman, like something out of a comic book. I very quickly, watching Knight's movies, realized that he was completely unique. His mind's making webs that other people do not make. Every single word he's chosen and every frame he designs is done with a great deal of forethought. Knight very much approaches it like a piece of theater in that this is the text. Everybody knows that this is the text. You can't mess with Shakespeare. You know, there's two types of filmmakers. There's the gatherers, which it's a completely legitimate way to make movies. And then there's the other way, which is Knight, is he's more of a hunter, as we like to call it. He knows exactly what he's gonna go shoot. He was so brave in Unbreakable. So many of those scenes were one single shot where there's no chance of cutting out for the purpose of expressing the emotion that he wants the audience to experience. Working with Knight is what I had always hoped making movies was going to be. He's always striving for the best. He's very open-minded, challenges himself, challenges us, and ultimately we end up with a movie we're all really proud of. He's very meticulous. He spends an enormous amount of time on the prep, particularly on developing the script. I mean, there are probably 50 drafts of that script, and there were probably 75 cuts of the movie, maybe more. I understand exactly why I wrote every word and didn't write that extra word. So that causes discipline in a good way and makes him focus in on the internal drive of the character in that moment. You guys like cartoons? It's all telling a story with not just the dialogue and the acting, but with the camera just as much. I mean, Knight's such a student of film, and it comes across in everything he does. For me, making movies is a, a version of torture. It's really just like, I have two gears. I feel pain and then no pain. So the goal is to feel no pain. This isn't really about pleasure or anything like that. This is just a, 
I'm just always kind of racked with insecurity and like anxiety and my God, we're running out of time. We're never gonna get this scene. We're never gonna get this performance that I want. But on the outside, I'm like, yeah, hey, how are you doing? Good to see you. Some directors sort of sequester themselves away and Knight, that's not his, it never had, it wasn't then and it's not now. Like he knows everybody's name and it's just very approachable. The more I felt exhausted and really driven to challenge myself, the more the movie represents something distinct and really beautiful and has a, a, a real sense of representing this whole era of my, of my career. We talk about the visual effects on the movie. I think you have to talk about the the other bigger umbrella thing, which is that we have to achieve everything we want to achieve and make it feel grounded, and yet on some level have to compete with the expectations that come from a Marvel movie, that level of spectacle. And the CGI does that for us. Some of the visual effects we did in Glass are vein enhancements in the Beast character. The veins are a really big part of telling the story in Glass. They were, they were a big part in Split, and Knight really wanted to transfer that over to this film. We scanned James with a LiDAR scanner. We reconstructed him. He had to go CG for some shots just to get his movement looking realistic. The table throw is a, a bit challenging because we ended up combining, I think, five different takes. You have James McAvoy throwing the table at the cheerleaders. And on top of that, you have an object that flies from one take into another take during a pan. So when you watch the shot, you know, it looks like continuous one shot, but we're actually stitching several plates and elements and CG together. The most challenging visual effects shot on this film for us, I think, was probably the water tank shot. We had a huge water tank on stage, and the stuntmen went inside the tank, and they basically, it was like a big water slide. They opened up the gates, water came flying out, and they came flying out or tumbling on the ground. And there's a tarp on top of the tank that kind of gets like sucked in there and, and goes through as well. The tarp on top of the tank, I mean, there's just no way to tell that that wasn't a real tarp. There were so many different pieces to put together to make that what it was challenging but very rewarding. I'm really happy with the way the cracks came together and the water comes out and then when they they finally come out of that hole, I mean, I think it really looks like it all happened right there, even though it happened in two or three different places. Knight really wanted to make this particular skyscraper, the Osaka Tower, something that would draw your eye to it in every frame, whether we see it up close or from a distance. So we wanted to kind of keep it real and physical and something that you could believe could be built. We pitched him on these ideas of the, of the tower actually having these moving solar panels and light reflectors. And what you see in the film is what it ended up being, which was a really fun experience for our guys. There's no way some of the things that they put in that movie you would they know is CGI, just no way. You start to go, hey, this is possible, that's possible. Um, and it opens up a different, a different way of thinking about it. I specialize in those individuals who believe they are superheroes. We found this kind of basically defunct mental hospital, which used to house 2,000 people. It really existed. It was a fascinating place to shoot. It's abandoned, and it was fall, and it's getting cold. It's sufficiently spooky and creepy in there. You had to do a lot of long walking by yourself, you know, down those hallways, make some turns. It's a creepy place to shoot. I spend so much time in asylums. It's insane. Like, honestly, I've made like five movies in abandoned asylums, so I don't really get that nervous anymore. First of all, it had no heat, and we were shooting in the late fall. That being said, it almost becomes another character in the story at that point, which is potent and I think really, really great for the movie. There were so many salient features about the hospital that made me very attracted to it, but one of the ones that blew me away is we went into what I believe was their kind of meet your families when they come to visit room. 
and you open it up and it's this incredibly long room, dozens of windows lining the side and head to toe bubblegum pink immediately struck me as comic book. It's always exciting to get into these big old derelict facilities and see, you know, I mean, the architecture here is incredible. All this turn of the century sort of grandeur and, and the fact that it was a mental health facility and it gives us a lot of insight into what that world looked like. I could see that it was exactly what he had pictured in his mind. He's such a visual person, so he can see his story very clearly, and I think there was an immediate connection to the location. I don't think we could have imagined finding a place that satisfied all of our needs, and in fact, we found this location so early on that Knight was able to do some revisions to the script and write to the location. So really tailor visually what was happening in this space. We were there for so long, we definitely felt like the eeriness of the place, and it added a lot of character. I mean, even now, a month after shooting, it's still in my bones, that place, and I remember driving away for the last time, kind of like, don't look back, get, you know, escape, escape. <laughs>